they should be are we still going to receive calls from the regionals from AT&T from phone providers so in in the in the, in the instance of of this testing and the and the project i mean you're still you're going to get calls um depending on well, depending on how successful we are for testing right so let's say for example we go out we test at at Palo Alto and everything looks good Promethean is going to be setting up with you right they're going to be the ones that are going to call you and say hey mark we're coming out on march 5th and we need we need you know uh assistance we need we'll need a dispatcher we're doing test calls we're calling into the psap um we'll need to to uh to make sure that you have a resource available for us for a couple of hours so they will work with you on that right that that initial setup and getting everything going um our our branch is still working with promethean uh, right as as sort of the uh we're, we're tracking everything we're managing the overall health of the project but they are doing the individual work with autos with the region at your psap to conduct that testing so you'll you'll be hearing from them primarily on this effort on this prime pre-migration testing effort uh, and i believe we talked about it budge we were going to uh get them hopefully set up with oes email addresses we talked about this at the long-range planning committee yesterday so that you don't have a vendor email address go to your your spam inbox and, and and never be heard from again. So we'll be working to try and do that so they have at least a recognizable email address. It's not another vendor calling you, um, but they will be, yeah, they'll be managing the outreach. Okay, just at the PSAP level, we're still experiencing the same challenges that we've experienced the entire ride, right? Um, so people are randomly showing up saying, oh, we were, we were told somebody is available, you know, we're not on site. Packages arriving with, addressed to Cal OES at our location like there's just familiar. there's a host of problems that continue um, and it's it's really frustrating from the PSAP point of view right to try and work through these issues especially you know on short term when somebody calls and says hey I'm in the lobby of the police department and I need two hours of your time to while I work on absolutely. your equipment you know absolutely and we've been yeah we have been fighting that battle from from our end since the beginning of the project too I've I've I've, I've experienced that as well uh from our side uh, this one will be a little different in a couple of ways. Number one, uh, they don't have, there's no subcontractor involved. So we're working direct with, we're directly with Promethean and their team, and it's a small team. So this is a, this is like, you know, like a, like a strike team. This isn't a large vendor that's going to be subbing out tasks to other vendors. This is a small focus team that will be working directly with us. Um, and they won't, well, not hopefully it helps, but they won't be doing any on-site work. This won't be involving anybody showing up at your door. Everything they're going to be doing is is what we're doing. Oh, it's all remote work. So um, understood the, the challenges and difficulties that you're experiencing. We've heard that from several PSAPs, and we have talked to our vendors several times about that, um, whether or not they've gotten better. I, some have, some haven't, right? Uh, but in this case, uh, we don't anticipate those problems. Uh, this is a scheduled effort. This is a very concerted effort. We are uh, notifying PSAPs two weeks ahead of their test date. Uh, so if we have changes, if you can't make it, you know, we'll, we'll call you or Promethean will call you and say, hey, you're scheduled for March 5th. You, you know, the expectation would be you say, you know, well, hopefully you say, great, come on over. Um, but if, you know, you've got a parade going through town that day or whatever, um, you know, we will reschedule with you at that time and nobody's going to show up unannounced. And, in this case. OK, and I think we already made it through most of this slide in that conversation, so we are working through ways to, to communicate this effort, right? We want to make sure that the PSEPs are aware of what's going on. Uh, that's always our biggest challenge here at the state is is communicating effectively with 440 PSEPs. It is it is not easy, as you can imagine. Um, so we are doing everything we can to make sure that everyone knows what we are up to. Uh, we would appreciate any uh, any help that we can get from our board members. Uh, we, we briefed this out at the LRPC yesterday uh, to those groups as well, uh, that if you could take these back to your professional groups and 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 let them know what you know that the state is doing, it, it helps us immensely. It amplifies our voice and, and helps us uh, get that message out. So uh, we did some town halls, as Bud mentioned earlier. They were very successful. We had, uh, I think, uh, about 450 participants over four meetings. So great turnout. Uh, with with that success, we decided we want to do it again as part of that consistent messaging and really just trying to get out as much as we can, get that message out. Uh, we're going to do it again. So uh, we are putting together uh, another series of town hall meetings. It'll probably be uh, shortly after Calnina. 
Uh, we were talking about potentially doing them before Calnina, but the timing, you know, there's a lot going on. So uh, we're going to go uh, after Calnina. We're going to set these up. So we'll be messaging that out and getting that information out to, to the PSAPs again. Uh, we'll do the same thing again. And we, we encourage if you have any questions, if there are any uh, concerns, if you have any uh, specific asks, please get those to us so that we can address those and get those uh, into the town hall meetings. All right, uh, so with uh, our next steps here, we are doing pre-migration testing again, obviously with Atos in the region. Uh, we're, we're testing failover. It looks like Paul put these slides together backwards, so I already talked about all this stuff. Um, we just want to make sure the big point on this slide and, the, and the, the message that we're trying to get across is that we are testing, but we're not hitting every single transfer that you have in most cases i know i mean anaheim you've got a lot of you got a lot of transfers program so in an effort to not sit there for six hours doing transfers over and over and over again we're trying to streamline this process a little bit so one of the important things that we wanted to point out is we're going to come in we're going to test transfers we're going to do your primary transfer partners we're going to we're going to hit the ones that you transfer to every day or every week but the ones that you transfer to once a month or you know, uh, on, a, on a less regular basis, uh, we're we're not going to be testing those because we just we need to keep moving here and we need to get to the next PSAP. So the the plan is to leave PSAPs with the test numbers, the PIN numbers, and the protocol to test those on your own, so you can have that information and you can conduct that testing when you're able. And then you can of course let us know, hey, this didn't work. We need to get AT&T out to reprogram, or we need to get Optus out to figure out why it went to the wrong PSAP. We'll we'll do that for you. Uh, but we just want to make sure that we are hitting your primary transfer partners and 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 getting on to the next PSAP because we have a lot to go through. Any questions on that part of it? Okay, great. All right. So in an effort to uh well, to be as transparent as possible and to give uh, everyone in the field uh, a sense of, of what we are doing and how things are going, we've built a dashboard for this process. This may look familiar. It looks just like the Tiger Team dashboard for those of you paying attention. Uh, we repurposed it. We, we, we sort of uh, just used the layout that we had. We had a lot of really good feedback on the Tiger Team dashboard. Uh, we had a lot of people that, that uh, enjoyed that. So we took it, uh, we repurposed it for this project. We've beefed it up a little bit. We are now, um, we're showing process or progress, obviously, um, but what we've done is we've added in new search features uh, up at the top. I don't know if the laser will show. Yep, up at the top right here, you can filter now by county, region, or your PSAP. So you can now look and see how the progress is going in your county or in your region uh, for next-gen um, pre-migration testing and migration. So we're excited about that. We will... Uh, work with our GIS team, uh, Natasha's team, to continue to fine tune this. I think we're probably going to add a few more things to it at some point. I think Budge wanted to. Uh, right now, it's tracking pre-migration testing. I think Budge wanted something that would track actual migration as well. So we'll probably have to, you know, uh, make this either 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 come up with another one or put in another filter on this one that we could track migration as well. So we're working through that. So it's a work in progress. Um, but we wanted to get this prototype up. This is actually live and active on our website right now. So if you've ever been to our website, you'll know it's got the buttons uh, for each uh, grouping of, of you know contracts or technology or whatever you want to go look at. If you scroll down past that, there's a pre-migration testing 2024 link. Click that and it'll take you straight to the dashboard. So the hope is that people are watching this and, and getting a sense of, of how the testing is going, how, how things are, are moving along. Any questions on the dashboard? All right, let's get on to the stuff that everybody really wants to hear about. It's call handling. Um, I think that this slide, I've I've been watching this slide for a long time. Uh, we all have, uh, but I've been watching it very intently. And I am confident to say that we've had more progress in the last quarter than we've probably ever had in between advisory board meetings uh, for this particular slide for, for call handling. All of these vendors right here, uh, we're up in this area uh, last time we talked, and we have made just amazing progress in testing um, and validation with these vendors. I, I want to point out that this is not a, a horse race. This is not the place that each one is in and the progress they're in. This is uh, they're just we couldn't couldn't fit them all in that little phase two bubble. But they are all of these vendors here: Intrado, Carbine, Motorola, and then AT and T reselling. All three of those are all um, running neck and neck through testing, and they're all working diligently to get this uh, to get this done. 
uh, our engineering team has been made themselves available. I mean, almost around the clock to get this testing done in an effort to to push these out. So we're very, very excited. Um, and I think that fingers crossed, we're hoping to hear some good news this week. And I know we have, uh, you know, we have Carbine in there uh, this week. We've been testing and uh, Trotto's in there this week today testing. So we've seen some some very good progress here and we're excited uh, for our vendor partners to, to to have made it this far and we're anticipating good things uh, very soon. Questions? All right, and I want to point out that we are still holding strong. We are making sure that every vendor tap, uh, passes through region and prime testing before they are certified and allowed to sell. So if you are hearing from vendors, you know, if they're saying, hey, we passed labs, as of today, we're not quite there yet. The same three vendors have passed labs as always. It's still, you know, right now, uh, uh, Lumen, Autos, and NGA. Uh, but I'm telling you, we are very, very close on the other ones, and we are we are uh, hoping to see some progress in the next few weeks. Um, so if uh, vendors reach out to you and you want to know uh, the truth, you want to know where they actually are, um, you can always feel free to call us. Uh, we will give you the we will give you the up to the minute information on where each vendor is in the process. Janae is happy to do that. <laughs> I can feel her looking at me. I can feel it. <laughs> Yes, Mark. So question on that, when they do cl clear the lab, how is that notification made? You sent out a branch notification? No? Okay. Uh, yeah, the notification's made by the vendors. They start calling everybody. Great. Yeah. That's that's a great system. <laughs> hey, Andrew, can we add something on our website that lists who is on the contracts page that lists who's through labs? Yeah, that would be the way to do it. I think we've actually talked about doing that before. Yeah, and we've okay. because we've already got vendors reaching out, yeah, yeah. telling people that, oh no, we're through the lab, right? Yeah. And then, yeah, it, we, it's not true. So we can update our web. Our website usually takes only a few hours to update. So if they say they've passed and we haven't posted, that would not be accurate. So um, we'll get it on our website, and it'll be on the contracts tab where these CPE contracts are. As soon as they pass lab, we'll put it in there, and we'll get these three in there. And we can get that done. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. And it's been a it's been a very um, collaborative effort. It's really, I mean, honestly, these vendors have really come through. The our engineering team has really come through in these last few months to get this work done. So we're all very excited. Okay. Uh, so this slide is new. Uh, this is one that we haven't put up here before. Uh, it it does look like a puzzle that hasn't been put together yet, but uh, Budge asked us to go ahead and, and get this up for this meeting um, to make it sort of a matter of public record that we talk through our funding process at the state. A few things have changed, not a lot, but a few things have changed um, from the old way to the new way, and we wanted to do just a quick kind of semi deep dive into this to talk through uh, how the process goes for your piece app and for those listening at home so that, that there's a, a record of this. All of this information is available online in chapter three of our operations manual, but it's all spelled out. So it's it's not uh, it's not a workflow. So this one we we hope is a little bit easier to follow for the eye. Something just kind of a quick reference point. Uh, in order to fit it all in one slide, we had to we had to kind of pull back and make it a little bit of a of a higher level view. Uh, but I wanted to to walk through it and I wanted to make sure that everyone kind of understands the process. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to stop. But uh, <clears throat> and in a former life, I used to do this job, so this is near and dear to my heart. So I definitely. Um, uh, can answer your questions if you have them. So I'm excited about that. A lot of times in my job, I don't have answers. So on this one, I, I can get you. So uh, the PSAP starts the process off. And and Mark, you brought up a good point about how do we know when a piece when a when a vendor's through lab or when a system's through lab. Historically, the vendors have played a very important role in the ecosystem of of this process because they are the ones who show up at the PSAPs at that five year mark and say, Hey, did you know you're ready? State's got you know funding for you. You need to swap out your 911 system. 911 system, and so the vendors have played a, a pretty important part in this process for us, because you know we've got a lot going on. We do track who is ready to go, uh, but depending on our staffing levels and and what else is going on, sometimes we aren't able to be as proactive as we'd like to reach out to those PSAPs to say, hey, it's your time. Um, but uh, the vendors help us with that because that's it's in all of our interest to get that that equipment swapped out. So, what what happens is we determine the PSAP is ready to ready to go. You're at that five year mark on your current 911 system or seven year mark wherever you're at. 
you fill out our form, you contact our office. We, we have a form that just says, hey, I'm ready to I'm ready to get my allotment letter, sign it, send it in. Janae's team gets that form. Uh, her advisors then take that uh, take that form, open up a file. We, we, we start working with your PSAP, with your PSAP manager or whoever is assigned to the project. Uh, we calculate your allotment. That takes we 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 have uh, in contract. We have two weeks, ten business days to go ahead and get that allotment. We we uh, pull your call stats out of ECATS. We take a look at various factors, including call duration, um, abandon rate, um, you know, answer times. There's there's a there's a calculation for each piece app based on your size, based on the size of the of the volume of your piece app. So they get an allotment assigned. They get a dollar amount for you. They send you a letter saying you have X amount of dollars to spend. It is a um, it is not you have you can buy a system with X amount of positions. It is it is an actual a, a pool of money that you are allowed to pull from. And we'll talk about that in a second. Once you have that funding letter available or in your hands, you go you pick a vendor, you go shop around and we encourage active shopping on this because the pricing that is online, the pricing that is uh, on our website, the contract pricing is maximum allowable. So if you shop around and you beat the vendors up a little bit, sorry, you guys, uh, they will lower their prices a little bit to accommodate you so that you can go buy other things with that funding. We have a list of items that you can spend that money on online uh, after you've procured that 911 system. If you have leftover money, you can buy chairs, logging recorders, um, headsets. There's a, there's, a, there's a whole list of approvable items that you can spend remaining. We call them residual funds on. So, so you shop around, you pick the system you want, and then you start working with the vendor to um, generate that price quote and uh, SOW. So the vendor will generate the SOW. They'll send it to us. Meanwhile, as your PSAP has signaled intent to, to, to swap the system out, our office will make sure that we have circuits in place. So this didn't used to be a part of the process. We didn't have any additional circuits or provisioning of any circuits that had to happen. It was all camera. So we really didn't have the steps. So now we have to make sure that the vendor you've chosen has connectivity to the core that you physically are in. So, for example, I'll say if you pick a Zetron call handling system and you are in Synergym's region, we have to make sure that they have back end connectivity to each other in order for that to work. Now, we were doing them one at a time as PSA or as sorry, as vendors made it through the lab. But what we realize is it's very complex and complicated, and these circuits are taking forever. So we stopped that process, and now we're just telling everybody who gets to the lab, you order your circuits now, get them in, so that we can be ready for you, the PSAP, uh, when it's time to update that system. So uh, I left that in there because we still will make that validation to make sure that the system you've chosen has circuits available and that you can actually go live. Uh, but once you've created that SOW or the vendor has created that SOW for you and you've agreed on pricing, you will send that into our office. You'll be in communication, regular communication with our uh, with our analysts who will help you through this process. Um, they will validate that you got everything you need. So they will look through that SOW. They'll take a fine tooth comb to it and the price quote. They'll make sure that the pricing is contract compliant. That it that it that it's where it's supposed to be, so you're not getting you know overcharged, and they'll make sure that the SOW has everything that it's supposed to have per the contract. If that looks good, if it looks if it's not good, if something's wrong, they'll send it back, and they'll send it back to you and the vendor, and they'll say, hey guys, we found a problem, please fix this. We'll go through that process a few times, hopefully not. Once contract compliance is validated and pricing is validated. They will draw up what we it's it's a standard 65. It's a state form, but we call it our sample PO. We send that to you uh, and it basically creates that um, that uh, uh, point of clarity between you and the vendor of who's buying what, who's selling what, who's paying for what. We're on there, too, and it really establishes uh, that that binding purchase agreement. Uh, because the TD-288 that we generate is a commitment to fund. It's not a binding purchase agreement. It's not a PO. It just says state will pay. And so we've had, it's pretty rare, but we've had problems in the past with vendors who say, hey, I can't, I can't bill to this. How do I bill for this? And so the PO solves that problem for us. So we send the sample PO. We do that real quick. Usually one week or less, the, the advisor will get that out. Uh, PSAP looks at it, says, yep, good to go. Signs it, sends it back. Then we generate what we call our TD-288, our commitment to fund. That form literally says state commits to X amount of dollars to pay to, you know, Carbine or Entrado or AT&T on behalf of you know, Anaheim PD or Highway Patrol. 
And uh, we send that, the advisor sends that to the PSAP and the vendor at the same time saying, here you go, guys, here's your agreement, state's ready to go, we will fund you. And uh, at that point, you, the PSAP, schedule your installation with the vendor. Uh, we expect that should take 90 days uh, with cloud-based call handling to actually just move that equipment in. It's a pretty small footprint of equipment now to get that connectivity, set, you know, the connectivity should already be set. So to get that equipment in, get the, the workstation set up and to get you on that system taking calls should be 90 days. That's what we put in the contract. So that's what we're hoping for. Once that's in, the vendor has installed and you're happy with it and it's working and you're answering calls and, and you're, you had 240 consecutive hours of trouble-free operations. So that's 10 days of no, no problems, no tickets. The vendor will present you with a system sign off. It's a state form. So they have, it's, it's our form that they present you with. Um, you'll sign off. Yes, system is working as I, as I expect and, and hope it to. Then they will send that in with the invoice to our office. The vendor usually will send that in for us, but it, the PSAP can send in that, that form as well. Uh, you'll invoice us. We'll validate charges are all correct and everything looks good. We'll validate that. Yes, you actually did sign it. Nobody forged your signature. And then we will, uh, we'll, we'll pay that bill. And then, and then at that time, that system acceptance date, and this is the important part, that system acceptance date starts the clock ticking on your system. That's when that five-year funding cycle starts. Not when you started the project, not when you got your TD-288, but when you signed off on that system. And, and it's important to point that out because we've had PSAPs in the past who've taken a year to sign that form because they're not happy with the color of the layout of the buttons on their terminal. Or we have we have serious problems too, don't, don't get me wrong. Sometimes vendors really do have issues and, and there are audio issues or whatever that we have to work through, but it can take forever. And I think our longest one was two years where PSAP did not sign off. So in that case, five years came around from the start of their project. This uh, a, a PSAP that won't be named called me and said, hey, we're ready to go. And I said, I'm sorry, you have two more years. And they were, I mean, they were a little bit in a panic, right? Because, hey, the system's five years old. It's getting old. We got to go here. And I, we had to explain to them, no, you, you took two years to sign off. So we want to be clear that Yes, there are there is a potential for issues on site, right? You know, if you've got 200 feet of of, of coiled copper in the back and, and we have audio issues because of it and you can't move it, there's, you know, we have to work through that. The vendors will work through that with you to get you to sign off. They will dedicate resources after you've signed off to continue to work those problems. And so we just don't want any PSAPs to sit and wait and suffer through trouble for a year and not sign off. If you think it's going to go and you think it's going to be okay, Sign the form. The vendors will dedicate those resources. If it's if it's really bad and you need state involvement, we will get involved. We will make sure the vendors are are doing what they need to do to 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 make you whole. But we don't want you to be in a situation where five years down the road you want to get a new system and you can't. So that's the that's the importance there. That's the project or the the, the process in a nutshell. Um, there's a lot of little details and back and forth that we that we engage in at the, at the project level that I didn't want to really get into today, but I want to make sure you guys are aware of how this goes. And if you have any questions, I want to be there to answer them for you. Just a question on the circuit installs. Is that covered in a later slide or? No, we, we're not covering that in a later slide. Um, that is. Uh, famously, the circuits that we've been talking about in this board meeting for the last six months or so that we've been waiting on, a lot of, um, now we froze up, I talked too long. On the last slide, uh, with those vendors that have been making their way through the, through the, the uh, you know, through the process, there we go. Um, up here, through here, um, we're, 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 putting in connectivity for them to test with our lab. Whereas before we were we were saying, okay, good enough. We got our connectivity with the lab, we can test. And then when you are certified, you can go out and establish that those circuits with PSAP. And so once you know NGA started selling, we realized, okay, we got to get these circuits in. And that's that's when it really came to light that it's a that it is a little bit more of a labor intensive process than I think we anticipated. So that I put it in there. Uh, but it is actually happening right now for everybody. Uh, so the, the and that's why we had so many PSAPs on stop clock for NGAs because we were waiting on those circuits. Those are the circuits that we're that we're waiting on right there. So now that we're getting it all done, now we don't anticipate this being a problem in the future. When you're ready, uh, when when your preferred vendor gets through the lab, your circuits should already be in place. 
And just to clarify, these are circuits. So basically, it would be connecting NGA with Lumen, NGA with correct um, all of, and same for Atos, right? Correct. Atos has to connect to all of the different CPE vendors, and correct. once those are in, it should open it for everyone across the state. Correct. Okay. Thank you. What did but, I miss, Budge? Sorry, just there, so there's no firm because I mean the last couple of meetings we've asked, and you're like, no, they're coming, they're coming. So do we have? Yeah. Anything more than they're coming? <laughs> uh, I was asking about this yesterday in anticipation because I've heard you ask that on the last two meetings. I went and watched them for homework and uh, I, I, I heard you asking that question. And I was like, OK, um, what what I asked was, where are we with these and how are they looking? And what we understand is that the circuits now are in. Now we're going through the validation testing and turn up process. So I don't have a date for you today, Mark, honestly, um, but we are having a meeting this week with the vendors, we're, we're calling them all in and we are going to go line by line through this connectivity and we're going to um, basically get a, get a status and a date for each each and every single one uh, because it has been a lot of updates of they're coming, they're coming, we'll have them this week, we'll have them this month. Vendors, you know, sometimes they do that, um, but we are now, we're, we're, we're gonna be having a meeting with them this week to, to get final, final dates. Uh, but my understanding is they're in uh, but we're waiting on on validation testing and turnout. OK, so we can anticipate by the next meeting. Hopefully we'll have some type of timeline. I would say hopefully before then, because I would like to see vendors through the lab and done and ready to sell before the next meeting. So I don't know uh, if we can communicate that out. Much, but yeah, it's. When we have this meeting with them to go through line by line, what we're finding is like if you and I are trying to connect, I order a circuit, I coordinate where it gets plugged in in your data center. And we that okay, that takes months. Then the circuit's in, and I know it's in, but you don't. So then I need to communicate with you that it's in. You say, okay, it's in. So now we need to do cross connects. Well, each one of those conversations has taken a week or more to do the coordination instead of just figuring out, look, we need this done now. Get everybody in place at the right time to get it to get it coordinated and live and that's what the meeting is we're going to have this week with all the vendors to say look how can we stop this email back and forth because they're being respondent they're doing work it's just they're doing it serially you know i send you an email you wait a week and you send me a response back i wait a week send it back to you it just extends the timeline out we can't do that anymore and the reason why we can is the next slide that Andrew's going to get to is how many of these aged systems we have out here. And this really goes to Chief White's point. Are we going to get to a place where we mandate to the PSAPs, we as a board and as a branch, you have to replace your equipment now? That's ultimately where we're going to be, say, a year from now, when we've got all these processes ironed out. So that's where we want to be. We're just not there now. So uh, we once we get a timeline, we can publish it, obviously, on our website. We hope to have something way clarified and most that really completed by May when we meet again. So we'll have to find a way to communicate via the website that we've done that ahead of that. Obviously, Cal Nino will be our next opportunity to address a lot of folks, but uh, we'll find a way to get that on the website as well. OK, one last question, then we can move on <laughs> for me anyway. Sorry. Uh, so one of one of the particular CPE vendors, right, has many people who were now in line um, that, that they've signed up as, as customers. So then what is the expectation uh, once the circuits are in tested fully operational? What, what's the timeline for those piece apps that are waiting uh, for a system? That's this uh, 90 day clock on this. Right here. Uh, yeah, right there. So because they're all on stop clock right now because they're waiting for the circuits to be finished up for admittedly some time to your point, Mark. Um, so that 90 days starts as soon as that stop clock lifts, as soon as those circuits are in. And, in. and that's just going to depend on who's in line and where they are in line, because obviously the vendor can't work on 30 different they better. systems there <laughs> at once, right? Uh, I, I mean, honestly, we we haven't, sorry, getting away from the microphone, we haven't given them that that out. No, we, we've told them, you gotta, you got to get on your horse and get these done. So the fact that they've signed up, 30 and have 90 days to do all of them is going to be a stretch for them. But I think the expectation is is there that they work on them concurrently, not serially. We have a lot of PSAPs to get through to change out old, old PSAPs. And so uh, that, that is our expectation that they, they get to work on all of them at the same time. OK, thank you. And I think there's a question online. No, hand went down. OK. 
question regarding ramifications if they don't make it that 90 day window or if it takes longer than what is it 10 days of trouble free 240 hours trouble free operation so that's that's two different sets mm -hmm. of of issues for us right um the 90 days there is an sla attached to that right so the vendor there is in contract a uh, a fine that we could impose should we choose choose to uh, on the vendor or credit it's not a fine I shouldn't say it that way it sounds so it's a credit uh, that we would ask for from the vendor if they if they go past that 90 days. Um, that's our um, that's at our discretion, right? If if there's a good reason for going over that 90 days, and it's you know maybe perhaps it's the PSAP's uh, responsibility or PSAP's fault that we went over, uh, we can choose to levy or not levy that SLA. Uh, for the system acceptance, the 10 days of, of trouble free operation, that one's a little uh, trickier. We don't have uh, a, a lever or a penalty imposed for for that because that one is is a little bit more fluid we want the PSAP to be happy and and have a system that is working for them uh, so we don't have any sort of all right you're at day 11 you you got to sign this thing um, if a vendor uh, doesn't isn't responsive and isn't fixing the issues that the PSAP has identified and and, and is holding up that sign off uh, we will engage with the vendor directly to to work with them on a case-by-case -case basis okay and just to clarify that's a calendar day not a business this is operation because yeah. it's 24 7. okay calendar thank you a lot of times in that place it's the psap asking for something that's not in the sow and not in the contract but they absolutely would like to have for operational support and that's where we run into our biggest challenge because we've got to hold to the contract that seems so, too subjective at that point yeah right. yeah if you want a green button and it's yellow and you're really adamant that's got to be green or it's not going to work for you well that's not in the contract so we, by contract, wouldn't be able to do anything. Obviously, the vendor would like to make you happy and make it green, not yellow. But I mean, those are the. I mean, it's it's an it's something we run into commonly where there's something aesthetically that that you want or workflow that you want that wasn't specifically identified in the contract. So they're not out of contract compliance. The system's not broken, but there's something you as a PSAP want that you know is in that aesthetic space. That's where we mostly run into problems um, in this time where we've had huge extensions. Yeah, the 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 really long ones are usually a a, a stubborn uh, piece of manager that doesn't want to sign off. Uh, but I'm not. I don't want to diminish. You know, there are there are sometimes some real issues that that cause us to go long. And and um, when when we get to that point, generally it's more of a collaborative approach than a punitive approach. So Janae and her team will, uh, the advisor, the 911 advisor who has walked the PSAP through this whole process, will um, you know uh, engage with everybody to set up a weekly or biweekly or sometimes daily call, depending on the severity of the issue, uh, so that everybody is actively working it and we're all at the table and we're all trying to get to that to that finish line. So that's that's a, a common one that we'll do when we have a, a sign off that's taking a long time. And then the differ the big difference for this contract from previous ones is if it is a contract compliance issue, there's a functionality that's clearly outlined in the contract that's failing. At this point in the process, we can say, OK, vendor, psh, you're gone. You're not compliant with the contract. And we start over another 90 days with the next vendor. We would never have that capability in the old space because on-prem equipment had been installed and you know, you're know 120, 180 days into the process. This is a lot more flexible, uh, which, which we like. Uh, we hope never to get there. And that's the point of all the lab work and everything. But really, in terms of contract compliance, we get there. And if it's a contract failure, we do have that ability uh, at this point in the process. Uh, and it's a real capability where we could just say, OK, everything's here. Let's go back to the beginning and start with CPE vendor number two. And so uh, that's that's we're excited about that ability. We hope we never have to use it, though. We actually, I've personally had to do that once in Legacy, so it's a fun story. I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> so if we get to that point, then the PSAP is not penalized. No. no. Okay, any other questions on the process? Okay. Well, if you do have questions, please be sure to reach out to myself or Janae. Uh, we will help you out and, and walk you through any questions you have, any PSAP. Uh, we're happy to, to help out. Her advisors are very knowledgeable. We are getting that team staffed up slowly but surely. Uh, so we, we, we are looking forward to getting this process uh, back in action. 
OK, so let's look at uh, what we've been working on. So Mark, you you talked about it a minute ago with the stop clock that we're experiencing with our sites that have been turned or, or sold to uh, our sites that have been approved. We have, I think, Janae, 30 ish approved for next gen cloud CPE. We're over 40. All right, so we have over 40 PSAPs that have signed going back to that process that have signed this right here. And we're sitting here waiting for this vendor installation, right? Because of that stop clock, the circuits that, that we just talked about. So we have 40 PSAPs that are at that point. So that's really good. Once we get that hurdle cleared, we will be able to open the floodgates. Um, looking over the past few years, you can see that number dwindling. I mean, obviously 2020 uh, was the last year that we probably did actual Vesta and Viper uh, change outs. Uh, then we, you know, uh, yeah, for those who have been uh, around for a while, remember the the issue we had there and we had to um, turn down those sales for uh, I3 contract compliance. So 2021, the 35 there, and even that eight into 2022 were residuals from those same installs from, from works in progress. Um, so that number, that eight right there really illustrates what I was talking about, that sometimes the sign off can take forever because uh, those PSAPs were probably they probably signed on at the at the at the the last minute right before we 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 cut off contract uh, we cut off sales, um, but that's how long it can take or did take in that legacy world. So so eight in twenty twenty two that one in twenty twenty three is is our desert hot springs that's our our live site with NGA. We have not signed system acceptance yet for any in twenty twenty four. We we anticipate with those forty that are ready to go, uh, we should hopefully open those floodgates up pretty soon here. And this number, as I mentioned before, I watched the last few advisory boards uh, just in um, in preparation for this, and I was looking specifically at these numbers. And so we're watching it climb slowly but surely. Um, we're adding about 10 PSAPs per quarter to this list, uh, this total down here, this 218. So this number continues to climb. Um, it seems fairly consistent uh, that PSAPs are dropping into that year 7, 8, 9, and 10 bucket. Um, but you know we are we are desperate to get these here done these eight nine and ten is the is the big the big push for us we just don't want to see these slip any further the 218 psaps now we're almost officially at half of our psaps are now over five years as you know 440 total that's that's a huge number that we've never we've never been in this territory before so we definitely want to get out of it quickly we have fiscal and operational reviews um so we've talked about these before. These are our offices. Again, as JNA's team, our advisors, uh, this is a, a program that we implemented uh, several years ago uh, to get out, to get to the PSAPs, to establish a um, you know one-on-one -on -one, face to face uh, interaction with the PSAPs to build the relationship, to come out and and basically do a um, it's kind of a kindler, gentler audit, right? We, we come out, we bring our documentation to show what we've purchased on your behalf to validate that everything that we paid for is in fact present at your PSAP uh, and to go through the offerings that the 911 branch can do just to take, you know, two hours out of your PSAP manager's day and to sit down one on one and ask questions, answer questions and go through whatever you need. Um, we traditionally have done these three per month per advisor uh, with the staff historically of four that came out to 12 per month. Uh, obviously, you can see there we have not been hitting those numbers. 2020 was uh, the last year that we had a full slate going. We had a full team going. Uh, then in March, obviously, COVID hit. So we had 25 done prior to March. So we were doing we were doing fine. We were on that schedule. Um, and then it shut down. Uh, PSAP shut their doors. We, we really there were no non-essential personnel allowed in in the building in most cases and so we suspended the program uh, 2023 we 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 did ramp it back up but uh circumstances collided we uh lost our entire advisory team almost all at once uh so uh that, that 22 up there is almost all single-handedly a uh, teresa fryer so she was uh, she was holding down the fort and doing what she was supposed to be doing but there was only one of her so that's why that number is so low in 2024 i anticipate um, now that we're getting some folks on we'll probably be ramping that those visits up pretty quick, but it looks like we haven't haven't quite got started on that just yet. So, <laughs> uh, and if you want a four, if you want a fiscal and operational review, uh, they're very uh, helpful to PSAP managers, especially new ones, especially somebody brand new in the position who has no idea that we even exist. It's a great opportunity for us to come out and show you what we can do for you. It's free money. Uh, you just got to know how to spend it. So it's a, it's a good opportunity to um, to get some education. So call us if you want us to come on out.
Uh, kind of hard to see the counties on here, but that's not the point. We just wanted to show that we are um, we are still working through. We have three advisor spots now that are vacant. Um, Teresa Fryer is our is our champion. She's our loan holdout. She's uh, been holding down the fort for us for a while now. We hired Heather Crane. Uh, she's coming in. She's training up, doing a great job, learning up. And um, I think Janae is going through the process to get her other three vacancies filled. Right now, the HR process is taking a little longer than we would like, but that is just the way it goes in state service. And so uh, we anticipate these at least two of these three being filled this month, right? And then the third one has got to repost. All right, so we'll have by the next meeting, we'll have four, probably not the fifth. So uh, looking forward to getting these people in and getting them trained up. Oh, and if you're on this list or if you're looking, watching at home and your county is represented on here, but you want CPE, but you don't know who to call, just call Janae. If if you're not in Teresa's column or Heather's column, call Janae. Call me. We'll get you in there. We'll get you set up. Okay, so the statewide staffing study, uh, we had we extended this out. So last time we spoke about this at the last advisory board meeting, uh, that 571 line level surveys completed uh, was that that number was the same uh, last time we did it. So that survey was very successful. We got a huge response on that, and we I believe we closed that one out. We didn't, we didn't leave that one open for for further responses. But the PSAP manager surveys, uh, we were having a, a pretty a low turnout. We were having low success rate and completion rate on that. So um, we talked about it, I believe, at this advisory board meeting. And um, it was it was really we talked about it yesterday as well at the LRPC, uh, but really it um, it came to light that it, it was just it's, it was a big survey. It was a long survey. It was very involved. There was a lot of numbers that had to be pulled. So it was just difficult for a lot of peace apps to get that done. Managers are busy. They got other things to do. So what we did was we kept the time period for that survey open. We reached out and and uh, I believe that um, the 911 authority team reached out personally to every PSAP manager that hadn't finished it and said, hey, what can we do? What can we help you with to get this done? Uh, here's the fields you can leave at zero if that helps. Like we, you know, we we skipped some of the unnecessary stuff and we reversed the numbers. So last time we met, it was 25 surveys completed with 50 potential or 50 partially done. And we flip flop that. So we're very excited about that. We got a, a little bit of a better return on that. Um, that survey closes now this month. So that'll close out and 911 authority will start to uh, analyze the data, uh, I guess, starting in March. So we'll have a draft uh, staffing plan or retention plan for the next meeting. We talked about this yesterday, Budge, and I wanted to get your, your thoughts on this. So I see May and August up there for draft and final. The LRPC had asked, and we can, I don't know if this is the appropriate venue, but they had asked if they were going to be afforded the opportunity to see it prior to release so they could perhaps uh, help us with feedback on that if they'd have it early in May before their meeting. The LRPC has one off cycle meeting that they can schedule. It's not required. They can have that in April. We talked about that, that as well. That, as an that would put it ahead of May and then that doesn't disrupt us because if we push anything farther, then we would have to see it in August and then approve it in November. So which yep. would way extend the timeline. So the best way would be for the LRPC to just go off cycle meeting in April, talk through just for that one specific item, and then they'll see it well in advance of May, and then we'll get it to the advisory board in May. The feedback from the advisory board will be incorporated, and then we'll finalize it in August with a recommendation from the advisory board on, on what the branch will do. If it's if it's completed by then, hopefully, right? Yeah, okay. yeah they've got to, well, they got to get it done. Yeah, they'll have to get it done by the, Okay, and that 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 it was could be end of April too, because we're middle of May for. Yeah, and and that was so we 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 talked about it yesterday, and uh, we were prepared to just if it was done at the beginning of May to have the LRPC put their running shoes on and review it quickly before the meeting. But if that's an option, we'll do that as well. And then our final draft is due August, so I think it'll be the same process, right? I get that in front of the board, get approved. So, any any questions on the staffing study? All right, so setting a fund condition statement, uh, no changes, no issues right now. Uh, I know that's a little bit of a uh, tough to read, but we wanted to leave this in here. Obviously, we, you know, for for purposes of a public meeting, we wanted to make sure that this data was present for everyone. Uh, but there have been no changes to the fund, 
And we are right now at this time in sort of our uh, what we can call our quiet period for for this particular set of of uh, events. Uh, the uh, revenue uh, collection and analysis begins in June. So right now we're in that period where we're 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 waiting for June to come around so that we can start to get that that data from the providers. We can start to analyze it to uh, to set the fee uh, for next year. Uh, once we have looked at that data in June. We provide a recommendation in August. We send it to CDTFA in September, and then we decide on what the fee will be. It has been 30 cents for the last three years. It has remained static. We have not needed to increase or to change it. Um, so we will find out probably uh, by the next meeting, by the next advisory board meeting, we will be uh, getting ramping up to begin that process. Any questions? Okay. And that's. So that finishes up agenda item number five. No, it was a lot of data. It always is. Um, that's the main main point of this is for us to to hear from you all. Any questions from the board on, on agenda item number five? OK, any questions from the public either online or in the room on agenda item number five? All right, agenda item number six is uh, alert and warning, and this is a standing item. Uh, there were some concerns uh, well, a couple of years ago, really. I think those have settled out. We continue to provide the data. Um, it's it's on the slide in front of you. I don't know, Andrew, if you have anything you want to add, but um, you can see from the numbers that the system is just steadily uh, increasing in terms of how much it's being used with our total count sitting at about 35 million messages that have been sent uh, in the system. And then last the last quarter of last year, there was over 6 million messages that went through the through the system. So any questions or comments from the board on that? Go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry, can we go back to item five? You certainly can. Um, so the um, I believe there was a budget change proposal that was proposed to um, somewhere at the, at the subcommittee, I'm not sure exactly where, um, for the set of funding to be increased next year. Um, is this the place to talk about it or? Yeah, certainly there was a BCP a budget change proposal that was submitted um, to address the movement of information from the 911 caller to the first responders. Uh, and that BCP is being talked about through the budget cycle. Um, the BCP is available online. If if approved, I have no idea if it would be approved, it would result in an estimated five cent increase in the fee. And the way that that works is it just this appropriated number that's on this slide would just be increased. And then when once that approval happens, we get the number of access lines reported to us. We look at the uh, revenue that's still left in the fee, and then we just simply submit what the new fee would be um, to the Department of, of Fee and Tax Administration. OK, so in reading it, it seems like the, it would be four years of funding for 13 limited term positions and then two 12 new positions um, for radio. Uh, the radio, the Chris side of things. Can you speak to how, why setting the funds would be used for that? Yeah, so in the statute that was written, uh, if you go to the, the revenue and tax code, setting is available for use to in if you're moving the information from the caller to the first responder. So if it's in that call flow, things like CAD and you know 911 systems, the 911 network, and obviously the radio system is used, to move information there as well. And that aligns with the FCC usage of the 911 fee as well. So that's how the statute is written. And this would be used to uh, help uh, build the infrastructure for a statewide interoperable radio system that is used specifically to support that 911 call flow for agencies like CAL FIRE, CHP, Parks and Recs, Fish and Wildlife, those agencies are what we're looking at as well as extending the use of CRIS for local agencies. So we're talking to San Benito County, Mono County is already on the system and other local agencies would be able to take advantage of that infrastructure as well. OK, I mean, just from from uh, a, a visual point of view, the idea that we'd be using setting up funds for radio equipment and radio positions, it, it, it may be a hard sell, at least to some of our membership, um, and we did specifically when 988 came up right we we said hey we want these funds just to be used for 911 so that we've had some concerns from our members about it and some we're having some discussions about it but 
yeah. So that's the overview of, of the proposal. So, yeah. Okay, more to come. Yep, more to come. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments on agenda item number six from the board? Go ahead. Uh, two things. One of them is that um, I don't know if we can do it now for us to be agendized, but I don't think we need to keep this one going. I know you have limited staff, and I think we've sufficiently addressed the concerns that were raised. Um, it is much secondary to the whole 9-1 project, but at some point, I think regarding RAVE, um, there is the issue of confusion with the citizens because of their app that's Smart 911 that we aren't all subscribed to. Um, so anyhow, that's for a future thing. It's much lower priority, but just we keep it in the back of the mind. But I would support removing this going forward unless there's something specific we need to share. Okay, so any discussion, the the suggestion or the proposal uh, or the motion is to remove the uh, standing agenda item for the alert and warning update. Any discussion from the board on that? Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. A second from Kurt. All right, so we'll go through a roll call order. So the motion is that we remove the alert and warning standing agenda item. So um, Chief Ellison. I agree. All right, Kurt. Agree. Chief White. Agree. Mark Chase. Agree. All right, Chief Ramirez. Agree. And Chief Gonzalez. Agree. All right, so we will update that and we will remove that from the uh, next agenda. Of course, at any time we can add it back in and we can always talk about it during public comment at any meeting as well. So appreciate that. All right, um, any questions or comments from the public on agenda item number six? We're online or in the room? No, okay, thank you. Moving on to agenda item number seven. Um, and I think you're done, Andrew. I'm going to give a quick update here um, on the 988 system. Um, we have a 988 board meeting tomorrow where we will spend two hours talking through this. So I'm certainly not going to be able to do it justice in the, the one minute that I'm going to give. Um, we are working through the testing and validation process of the interaction between 911 and 988. We're also working on some of the um, policy around when a call would be transferred between 98 and 911. The technology facilitating the ability obviously needs to come first because once the policy is in place, you have to have the capability. And we're working with uh, SAMHSA and Vibrant on an MOU to ingress calls into this new system. Um, and that process has been ongoing for a couple of months. Uh, Melanie has been assisting with that, and so we do not have an estimated time of when that MOU will be uh, signed, but that is needed. That would be the next step needed to actually ingress 98 calls into our new system, and then once that's done, we've got two different groups of when they would um, uh, come onto the system. The statutory requirement is for us to be finished by July of 2023 with the deployment of this new system that supports the integration of 911 and 988 and the interoperability of those two systems. So we're trying to meet that that goal, um, but at this point it, it's certainly going to be challenging for us to, to meet that. Um, like I said, there's a, a full meeting uh, tomorrow on this and in addition, the California Health and Human Services Agency in California has stood up a policy advisory board that has met a couple of times already and uh, they meet quarterly as well. They're developing a five-year implementation plan um, that would uh, outline some more of the details in the entire continuum of care with respect to mental health and 988. Cal OES, in anticipation of needing the software to support mobile crisis teams, um, we have uh, issued a RFP and that we hope to sign under contract by June, a July timeframe, some software to support dispatch capabilities for mobile crisis response teams. So that's an effort that the state is working on as well. So that's a quick summary of where we are with 988. Happy to answer any specific questions uh, related to 988 and the interaction with 911. Any questions from the board? All right, any questions or comments from the public? Okay, again, if you want a deep dive, there'll be a two hour meeting 
tomorrow, provided we have a quorum uh, for that board meeting. OK, uh, long range planning committee. Uh, we're running with about 10 minutes left where I know some board members. Uh, um, we you know, have other meetings. We will try and finish by then. Uh, is the LRPC chair online ready to give a report? OK, Andrew, you want to pinch hit and give a quick summary or somebody. Of you were at that meeting we can give a quick overview of what happened. Oh, or a member. Yeah. Absolutely. And as as uh, as we're getting ready for this, keep in mind the LRPC. Really is an extension of this board. So as you're hearing this update, if there's anything you uh, you as a board member would like the LRPC to consider, um, would certainly this would be the time in the agenda to talk about that as well. Go ahead, sir. Good morning. My name is uh, Jeff Logan. I represent on the LRPC for the California Fire Chiefs Association. And uh, this uh, past meeting was my first uh, meeting to attend, and there was a lot of information. Much has been covered here already. Um, but one of the things that we did work with with this group uh, specifically is to uh, uh, take a project to assist the 911 office with some of the messaging that is coming out with some of the uh, testing that will be going on and some of the work that Andrew discussed. And so the LRPC is going to try and um, help with that process. Um, also talking about some of the technical issues that are coming forward that have to do with complex issues such as um, uh, routing for 911 calls and uh, alternate uh, routing. Uh, so we, we're taking that project on. And then uh, there was a lot of discussion of uh, re-engaging uh, with the uh, what's known as the technical task force by region. And uh, so we will be working uh, in our next meetings as we close out this year to work on a strategic goal uh, for the year so that uh, we have more connection with them and also helping some of the regions that have a low membership participation. And happy to answer any questions. All right, any questions on the LRPC update? All right. Don't go anywhere yet because the next agenda item is the one that you really will take note of. Uh, so this is assignments for the LRPC. So we have a standing agenda item um, to make sure that we're addressing the membership of the LRPC, which I think we're in a pretty healthy place now. Um, but do any members of the board have any specific assignments or tasks that they want the LRPC to consider? I think we just discussed two at the last meeting, right? So um, taking a look at uh, potentially what the best practices would be in California for um, putting call takers at home if we needed to, what kind of technology is required, uh, different things that occurred during the pandemic in other states. Um, but if you could look into that, and then I can't remember exactly the second desk I think we talked about, was that the roulette of the alley? I think it was, yeah, that one I think we've addressed. That's why we didn't, yeah. Noted. Thank you very much. All right. So um, I don't know if we need to do a. It's just a recommendation. Uh, do we need to do a, a vote on that for the for a task assigned? I don't, I don't think so. It's not an agenda item or anything. But anyway, if we do, we can come back and vote on it. But um, you can add that to your list. So I think the three things you guys are working on is the the um, policy based routing and alternate answer discussion that you guys are working on. Um, obviously, this best practice for call takers at home, and I think some of the what was the third one entered the regionalization and uh, consolidation opportunities that are available with next gen 911. And really that goes hand in hand with the best pra best practice for call takers at home because regionalization consolidation hinges on CAD and radio being interoperable so you can actually do some of those kinds of things. So I think those fit ni nicely together. Absolutely. We're good to go on that. OK, all right. Any other conversation for the LRPC? All right, any questions from the public, either in the room or online? Almost, Jeff, you're almost there. <laughs> you see anything online? I just want to say thanks for, to Jeff. This is Alicia. I was in a noisy transition and didn't make it off mute in time. So big thank you to Jeff for providing the update there. Yeah, and for those not tracking, that is the chair of the LRPC. So thank you, Alicia. We appreciate that. Uh, and thanks for the comment. We appreciate it. 
Okay, uh, moving on to agenda item number uh, uh, 10, and this is uh, agenda items for future meetings. Uh, the standard agenda is in front of you, um, and, and you all have that. I'll entertain any motions to add additional agenda items for the next meeting. All right, not hearing or seeing any, and these are the dates. Um, if you could please take a look at your schedules um, for these next meetings and reach out to Samantha. Um, she's the board liaison. If you've got any conflicts, let us know. I want to make sure we've got a quorum in person for those meetings would be greatly appreciated. And they will always be here now. And they'll be here, yeah. Uh, we do have the ability to have them anywhere, um, but for ease, it's we certainly can support them here. Um, but uh, we've we have had agencies host us in the past. In the past, I think it's been about four years since we went somewhere. But I don't know, Samantha, are you ready to take the show on the road? <laughs> but yes, here at this location uh, works works well for us. All right. Any questions or comments from the public on agenda item number ten? All right, we're at public comment for uh, we'll start with the board. Any comment on anything that was not on the agenda? That the board wants to discuss. OK, any comments from the public either in the room or online for any members that were not anything that wasn't on the agenda? All right, seeing hearing none. Everybody's favorite slide. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? Could we circle back to the closed session? Uh, yes, uh, and that's agenda item number two, which we can take out of, out of order now. Go ahead. What's your what's your I just I, if um, if people have availability, I'd like to have closed session. If we could just discuss that issue that happened with the carrier and uh, what what actions were taken. OK, so I think we'd have to take a vote. Go into closed session, maintain quorum throughout the closed session, and then come back. So I don't know if everyone, if folks can support that, because that means we'll probably be about another 15-ish or so minutes. Uh, I have a hard stop. Uh, okay. I would not be able to attend. Let's we'll do it. I would support it. Can we just do it like real quick? It sounds like it's just some basic information. It is, but just procedurally, we'd have to, it would take. I couldn't get it done in three minutes. I guarantee you that. Can um, the information be provided offline direct to him as opposed to the whole board? Yeah, so, so how about this? If we have two options, because we won't have a quorum if we go past 12 because of schedules, we can start the May meeting with it and, and go direct into closed session there and have a deep dive where we've all got time to talk about it, option one. The other option is we can have a special meeting between now and then, but we'd all have to be in person for that. Right. Um, I'd, I'd support uh, next meeting if we could start in closed session. Okay. Just discuss. All right. We can start second that. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll go into closed session the next meeting uh, and talk that through and anything else that comes up between now and then, but that specific um, outage does qualify for a closed session. So we'll definitely do that. Yeah. And I, I apologize, Mark. We're just not ready with time today to do that. It's OK, thank you. OK, all right, we'll do that. OK, so now we're on this slide again, I think. All right, do we have a motion to adjourn? Yes. All right, Chief Ellison's a motion second. I have a second. Chief Gonzalez, do I have to take a roll call for that or can we just adjourn? All right, we are adjourned at 1158, two minutes ahead of schedule. All right, thank you all and appreciate it.